Hi, my name is Rebecca Zabarski with Parrot Analytics, and you are watching the Global TV Demand Awards Virtual Festival, which celebrates the people behind the world's most popular TV and talent. I have the pleasure to be speaking with John Hoffman, co-creator and showrunner of Hulu's Only Murders in the Building, which is a finalist for the most in-demand revolutionary series of 2021. Great to be here with you, John. So nice to be here with you, Rebecca. Thank you for asking us. And I, I love that we're a finalist. It's a thrill and an honor. That's great. Well, we'll get into a little bit more about what that means in terms of the global demand for the show. I've got some really great data points to share with you. Um, but first, let's let's talk a little bit more about the, the series. So I found one of the most interesting elements of the show is that it blends genre TV so well because it has all the elements of a murder mystery with drama and comedy, but really it's this true crime parody. And that's really interesting because we've seen demand for true crime series increase over the past year. And of course, there's been an explosion of podcasts for many years now. Uh, so tell us about the early days of creating the show and what that development process was like. What were some of the challenges to make this story come to life the way that it did? You know, it was, it, it, I it think of it in, in two ways, right? The challenges, as you're pointing out, um, to finding our own niche in, in how to sort of explore a true crime story. You know, there, as you say, there's so many. Um, and how do we, you know, put our own footprint uh, with, with this show? And then the, that's the challenge. And then the privilege uh, was the crazy auspices around the show that I entered into. I was uh, invited into the show by Dan Fogelman and Jess Rosenthal, who introduced me to Steve Martin, who had an idea. And then it was realizing, oh, wait a minute, Steve Martin, Martin Short are going to star in this. And so thinking in terms of the brilliance of the two of them and thinking how, how do we take that satisfy an audience's delight in wanting to see what they do best, but then knowing what tremendous versatile comedic and dramatic actors they are and the leaps they take as comedic actors, how do we then take our story, our approach on this true crime narrative uh, into something that feels fresh? Mm -hmm. uh, because it's a demand of television now to sort of do something that catches attention. There were many expected ways I think this show could have gone. And um, happily, everyone involved from Dan to Steve to Marty to Selena, who became a part of it shortly thereafter, and really helped define that sort of modernizing of these classic comedians with uh, then the approach we took to the true crime stories, it lent itself to have already a certain freshness, but ultimately we leaned back into the idea of looking at everything through a lens of classic meets modern. Mm. Um, classic legendary comedians meets the most modern of young women. Mm -hmm. um, New York being set in this pre-war, stunning architectural landmark apartment building but knowing all of the uh, sort of landscape changes that are happening in major metropolises like New York of the new modern architecture and all of it, the technology and true crime stories, mysteries, old school mysteries that I think sort of Charles and Oliver would have known and loved are now being matched by true crime podcasts and documentaries and, and serial stories uh, on, on television and in movies. So, in that way, it all kind of felt of a piece with, with when we put it under the tent of classic meets modern, and then we just let our imaginations go. And happily, Hulu and the studio and everybody involved said, yeah, go with those leaps you're taking. And it was thrilling that way, creatively. Well, and it obviously paid off. Um, you know, uh. the, the, the demand data that we see tells us that only murders in the building really was able to leverage those cliffhangers and suspense kind of throughout the, the season to grow the demand each week. And it ended with higher demand than any of the other recent Hulu premieres. Um, and, and 
you know, it peaked in demand nearly 40 times the average series in its at its finale. So, okay, of Rebecca, course, you're going to be telling me you're going to be telling me so many new things that I'm going to be like my jaw is going to drop because I don't know any of this stuff. I only look at the sort of creative and the how does season two come together. So this is very exciting. If you drop those kinds of things, I'll be like out of my mind. Well, and then of course, <laughs> Hulu's president said it's their most watched comedy of all time. So it's captured attention of so many audiences around the world. And something you know to note is the data that we that we look at is global. We're not just looking at American or North American audiences. These are people all over the world. Um, oh my God. So why do you think the series has captured attention of audiences around the world like that? You know. Many reasons, I, I hope. Um, I worked with, uh, you know, beyond just the incredible talent involved. That's a huge draw. Everyone loves Steve Martin and Martin Short and Selena Gomez. And that combination, I think, piqued interest. Um, a lot of people, I would imagine, were a little suspect as to how that might work. And so much goes to their their incredible talents, comedically, dramatically, and as a trio that that they didn't know how that would work until just a few weeks before we started shooting. And, and it, they found their groove. And the, the lovely thing about that was the marriage of them as talents and human beings coming together to do this show together matched the narrative of our show where three strangers come together and, and find their own way. So we watched that literally on screen that, bonding happen from very early on reticence to hopefully deep friendship by the end of season one and find their own comedic groove together. That was the thrill to watch Selena find her path in between a very established comedic duo uh, was really thrilling to watch. And she was amazing at the way she carried that off. Yeah. I've seen some of the late night interviews and it's really funny because you really do have these two older <laughs> kind of established but zany and silly guys that have this you know incredible history of comedy and drama like you've mentioned huge, I'm a huge fan and then Selena yeah. Gomez comes in and she kind of brings a sophisticated attitude but obviously um, you know represents this younger generation and I did think you know this is unique this is a unique <laughs> trio what <laughs> I you know I <laughs> Skeptical was not the right word for me, but intrigued, really intrigued for, for, for myself, right? And maybe others um, in millennial or, or to the Gen Z generations who are kind of interested to see how it's going to work out. And you can feel this really great comedic chemistry between the three of them. Uh, you well, know, that's it. It's the balance. I, I mean, really, the, the, the thing that I love by the end of it, I, I didn't, I know I didn't think of this at the beginning, but by the end of it, I do think uh, there was something to the idea that these two very well-established legendary people, uh, Steve and Marty, uh, were known by so many, but not by fully by a new generation coming up. Selena is known by that entire generation, almost all of them, I think. Uh, and, and then yet there is an older audience that Steve and Marty bring as well that may not have known the work she did as much. Um, so it was this nice synergy between the audience discovering mm -hmm. on either end of the age spectrum uh people that should be discovered <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah. i mean how how was it decided to bring selena into the the trio well that that was um i that was dan fogelman suggesting um when we were all talking about it um we should lean into the most unexpected choice and i I thought, well, I, okay, let's think on that for a minute. And um, it didn't take actually too long to get to someone like Selena. Mm -hmm. And then meeting with Selena um, on Zoom uh, was, was the real revelatory moment because A, she's a true crime nut. And I didn't know that. Um, she related to Mabel in a lot of ways, just naturally. Um, she'd gone to crime con with her mother uh, like a year before she, and, and people were walking around crime con and going, what are you doing here? She's like, I'm here because crime con. <laughs> um, wow. That's um, awesome. So, yeah. I love that. I love that. And she told that story to us on the first interview. And I was like, Oh my God, you're kidding. And then it was just the way I had 
sort of known of her career as an actress prior to that. And I was so intrigued. First of all, she was a, you know, in the Wizards of Waverly Place, she had her own pocket of her comedic style, mm -hmm. which I thought was going to be key, certainly with these two forces of comedy. Um, but she had her own way. And I thought, well, there's something in that that could work. And then I think I was really impressed by the choices she had made as an actress mm -hmm. uh, prior to our show, which were very independent features that that, you know, from legendary artists. Uh, and, and I thought, oh, she's got a real edge to her. Um, and I like the direction she's going with her career acting wise. And, and all of that felt of a piece, but it was really sitting and talking with her and then watching her read with Steve and Marty after we had already said, yes, you're in this show and we're going to do it. And it was literally two weeks before we started shooting when all of us were crossing our fingers for the first Zoom table read of episode one. I was gonna ask this, and this was all virtual, I assume, at the time. Wow. All virtual. And she came and I was like, my, I was completely taken aback. She took her time. She just kind of, I wanna say, decimated them in her quiet <laughs> way. <laughs> Coming in, like laying them down, like just, uh, no. Just her tone, everything was so counter to how they were approaching things. And I watched them get taken aback. I thought, oh, this is I have this is going to work. We all felt it. We all called each other right afterwards. We're like, she came to play. It was incredible. So that was where it was the first time of like, wow, we have something. I love it. That's incredible. It yeah. it, it is really interesting what you say. You know, classic meets modern. What a yep. perfect blend, right? In terms of the casting and and just the storyline, as you mentioned. That's right. That's right. Yeah, it was a very ingenious idea that Dan had to sort of go in that direction um and it was uh and and then it was we were able to you know with Steve and Marty it was very clear how to approach sort of these characters of a of a actor from the 90s uh <laughs> who had a big hit series and and a director who hasn't seen a hit recently in years at all mm -hmm. but in New York and I knew those types of characters and somehow meeting Selena and then in some way tying some personal elements of my own story into that character, I found a way to sort of have touchstone points mm -hmm. to write all three with the brilliant writing uh, team that we, we assembled for the show and Dan and Jess, everybody involved. But those voices seemed much more accessible to me mm -hmm. um, than I, I expected, truthfully. And, and the last key was, was Selena playing Mabel. What do you mean by touchstone points? Like when you're writing, I mean, nothing is more intimidating, right? Than having someone who is known uh, for incredible work and now you're writing for them. Okay. And so you want, you have in your head, this lexicon of all of the things you've seen them do for your whole life. And yet you don't want to do exactly that, but you want to honor that. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you, you tend to write, the things that, you know, the way they sound in your head um, and how they might sound in these characters. And so much of that has to be married with the personal for me. Like if I feel like I can't get in with the characters that I'm writing, it's, it's hard. It's very hard. This was a, in certain ways, an easy show to write because I had that personal feeling. I was, you know, I was in the theater. I was an actor first before a writer and I have a theatrical energy about me that's very Oliver. I know those directors living in New York, you know, and I've been in those apartments he lives in. Sure. And Steve, I find a personality match because I'm a, a little more like him as Charles. I tend to be a little bit of a loner, tend to be a little heady, um, uh, you know, and, and I found him so beautiful and sweet in the, in the struggle to connect um, with other people sometimes. And then the question for me was Mabel and, and bringing Selena involved. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, this is a darker story, but there was a personal thing I was going through within the last year before I was brought on to this show. Uh, and it was a, actually nothing like anything I'd ever experienced in my life. But a dear friend of mine had died uh, a year before um, in a situation that looked with someone else in his gunshot wounds mm -hmm. Uh, looked like a murder suicide where my friend who I had been out of touch with for a long time uh, it looked as though he had been 
the shooter of the other person and then took his own life, mm -hmm. which was something I had been out of touch with him for so long, but I, I knew him as my dearest friend growing up mm -hmm. and I could not square this ending for him with the person I knew. Mm -hmm. So I had to go and I went to Wisconsin and I met his beautiful ex-wife and his two kids and I learned about him. I learned about his life and, and was sort of investigating right. uh, what, what happened to him. And then by the end of a year, uh, the initial sort of injuries and everything else that pointed to him being the person responsible reversed and the police report came out and it was actually affirming of that feeling I had had, like I couldn't imagine. And it was through the awful tragedy of it all, there was some peace in some way. Underneath all of that is Mabel's story um, with Tim Kono. And, and so I found it intriguing to write this story with, with this team of, of brilliant writers, but it was all very personal in some way. And that allows so much more depth. And, and if you're allowed to do it, and I think in this case, because it's a true crime, quote unquote, comedy, that's a comedy, but underneath it all, there has to be a real respect for each human life mm -hmm. and understanding everything to know the truth, to get to the truth of what really happened, to honor that person through that way. All of these themes found, them, found their way into our show. And so, yeah. Well, it's incredible to hear you share that story. Um, you can, I mean, just the fact that you have this personal history and story that really underlines much of the show. I mean, obviously you were writing what you know in some way. And- It really was true, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's interesting when we talk about true crime, right? Because um, there's, there is this search for truth and that is universal right across all sort of genres so that definitely you know you can feel that when you're watching this show of course that's this main kind of center center storyline of, of seeking truth so it's interesting to hear you talk about that more seriously um you know against the background of this being a comedy and it and it and it is hilarious so it's, it's refreshing to have some humor um <laughs> some yeah that, you know if you are obsessed with true crime it can get pretty dark and pretty heavy well and, that's it and bewildering you know, but it's anything, even in that experience of a year of investigating my friend's death and, and what had happened and all of that, uh, nothing makes me happier than finding like, these are the big moments in life where right on the edge of something tragic is something hilarious. And it's only because you're open up to feeling and you're open up to connecting with people. You know what I mean? Like those funerals where you've had the biggest laughs are the biggest relief ever. You know, those moments where you're not supposed to laugh and because it's just too serious and, and what's just happened and then you're laughing that I feel most alive in those moments. And so that was also something I wanted to capture the human, the personal. I didn't want to look at this as like a procedural. I wanted to sort of look at the ways all these people around this one person's death were affected and going forward and backward and how and how that connects all of us. Amazing. You know, there's been such a wonderful reception for the show and it's nominated for several awards. Of course, yeah. the finalist for our own Global TV Demand Awards. What sort of narrative do you think is missing from news coverage or, or write-ups about the show? Oh, such a good question. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure. There's been beautiful and wonderful things written and, and said about the show. And I hope all, the, all that you hope for, A, is that the people you're making it with, especially with such amazing talents, that they like it um, and at the end of the day and that they're invested and they really are. And that's made a huge relief. That was my biggest hurdle at the beginning of all of this. Um, and for the audience and for the narrative that's out there about the show, um, you know, we pitched this to Hulu as a story, first off, the first sentence of the pitch was, this is a story about connection in the modern age. Mm -hmm. And it's not how you might expect to think, but it's about loneliness, it's about isolation, it's about people coming out of their shells to connect because there was something drawing them and they feel the need themselves. It's a very simple premise, but in some ways, a very necessary premise for our days that we're living in and the days when we were making it and the days 
that we're going through now and, and reconnecting and all of that and assessing who's important and who's worth and what is the, how are you spending the time and all of those questions. But I think ultimately the thing that moved me most um, in the making of it was watching people come out of their homes uh, to come work yeah. on this show at a very delicate time in our world. And no one was coming out to do these things, but they came out to do it. And they came out to do it, I think, because of the people involved, yes, but also a need to connect in that way. Um, if there is something about the narrative that I would uh, just want to, you know, add to, it, I think it would just be about um, the dimensions of the show. Mm. Um, I think the challenges uh, to making a half hour comedy uh, with depth, with humanity, with mystery, <laughs> and with all of the elements that we brought tonally to the show, um, that the accomplishment for me is that not only did the people making it go with all of those things, it seemed that the audience embraced this sort of, you know, a little shift in storytelling. Mm -hmm. I think if you really step back and look at what we tried to do, um, I do feel most proud of the accomplishment of all of us in that we built a fabric of human characters living today in the world uh, by coming from different perspectives a particular character of New York that was hopefully brought to the surface. And then um, I think the storytelling is more complex um, than your average half hour comedy. That's, that's the main thing to sort of, I hope, I hope uh, for all of our work on it, mm -hmm. that that is recognized. It's nice to hear yeah. that sometimes it does get that way. Yeah, absolutely. It is incredible to see the type of um, such incredible quality storytelling that has come out of the past year and a half, considering our time. it's pretty, pretty, pretty amazing. Um, it's a so, real time for us. Yeah. Yes. And, um, you know, to, to wrap up our conversation, I want to talk about um, entertainment today in general, you know, 2021, of course, 2022. Uh, the theme of, of our virtual festival is revolutionary. And this show is a finalist in that category, which is essentially based on, um, totally 100% original ideas, right? The series was not based on a pre-existing IP or a franchise. Uh, so what do you think is most revolutionary about entertainment now and looking forward into 2022? Such a good question. I'm so excited to answer that from my own personal point of view. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's an incredibly exciting time. The most exciting time I've been writing for many years now in features and in television, but this, this time feels like the most embracing of the individual point of view. And what that means to me that feels most exciting is that um, risk-taking is embraced. Uh, individuality is embraced. The, that perspective that of the outsider is embraced. When I say the outsider, I mean human experience. Um, and, and we all are outsiders in, in a certain way. But I do think there's so many voices that are being, you know, now let in to tell their stories. Finally, I see incredible work being done. I did an amazing panel recently with, um, you know, everyone from, you know, the creators of Blind Spotting and, and Reservation Dogs and, and uh, the Underground Railroad. And it just went on and on. And I, I felt like, boy, what th this is really an incredible time. We get very caught up in like, what's next? I need a show. I need a show. I need, what's my next binge show? And I really think, my God, think of all of the things we have now. And we're now like wanting more and more, I know, but the, it, what it does is it creates a landscape for uh, so many artists now that I don't think have had the opportunity to be let go and express themselves creatively in the ways that it's been very exciting to witness over the last several years. And that can go you know, across the board, I think about, you know, all of these shows, um, our show particularly, you know, I had a long talk with Steve Martin about this and, you know, he was questioning whether he wanted to act in the show when he first started to do it. Mm 
Um, but, you know, and there's always the risk involved too. And he's a 75 year old man. He has no reason to do this on, on one hand, but that's the thrill of it for me is to see someone like him come alive and come back in a certain way and be the brilliant self that we all know him to be, but in a fresh new way. And that's all we're asking like now for anyone to put anything on television or on streaming is just to say, bring your best self. And the greatest thing I feel like that's starting to happen most recently is that studios, networks, these streaming services are saying, yes, bring that. That's going to make a mark. Um, that's a nice synergy happening. And an incredibly optimistic view onto uh, next year, which I think is wonderful and something that we sorely need, I would say. Oh, yeah. Yeah, God, if I'm not, I'm, I, I think, yes. And I've said it many times, even when making this show, I said, if we're not laughing and having the best time of our lives making this show, we're all idiots. <laughs> we're all complete idiots. And I just really think that that's, you know, I agree with you. It's, it's been, um, I, the, the thing that's also made me happiest about the reaction to the show uh, and it was something that we thought of when we were making it was, my God, maybe hopefully we can be a bit of a light and a very challenging time in the world. And, and something that just people like are surprised by, they find a laugh in, they find a connection, they find something poignant, anything optimistic right now is um, I'm game to put more of that out there. Me too. Me too. Keep doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try. I'll Thank you try. so much, John. This has been a wonderful interview. Really appreciate your time and your honesty. Thank you again for joining us. It's such a pleasure, Rebecca. Thank you so much. A lovely conversation.